Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sunday to you. Happy, happy Sunday. It's a warm, 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 beautiful Sunday. Opposed to AY. That's my post there. Good morning to you. How is everyone doing? Thank God for what God has done and is doing and will do today. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. God has prepared a table before us today. Good morning, Sister Sister Tokbe. Sister Timmy Tokbe. Good morning to you. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sunday to us. Happy beautiful Sunday. And I'm so glad to be here this morning to bring the word of the Lord to us again. And I'm so sure that God is going to bless us especially this morning daddy i thank you for this session again i just want to commit everything we're going to do into your hands i ask that you will speak to us from your word and you will change our lives individually in jesus name let every one of us be transformed be equipped be strengthened be blessed be enlarged in jesus name send us your word O lord Take all of the glory. Take all of the honor. Take all of the adoration. In Jesus' name, I have prayed. Amen. <laughs> I saw your message. My friend, I saw your message and uh, you said you're not going to join. But God has dragged you here today. So even if you're going to spend five minutes, <laughs> you run away. <laughs> God has dragged you. <laughs> we have a special teaching this morning and it's titled When Kings Go to Sleep. When Kings Go to Sleep. When Kings Go to Sleep. And um, I want you to listen and I want you to please spare some time to listen to this message. It's going to bless you so much. I believe by the grace of God. And uh, we're going to apply this message into our individual lives. And you're going to see how important it is for you to listen to this teaching. Please help me share this on your timeline. As many people as possible to come and join by the grace of God. When kings go to sleep. And the anchor scripture, the anchor scripture for this teaching shall be taken from Second Samuel Chapter 11, verse 1. I'm going to read just one verse and then I just dive into the teaching. Second 11, verse 1. Second Samuel 11, 1. It happened at the time when kings go out to battle that David and his servants with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. But David remained at Jerusalem. So when kings go to sleep. So let's dive into the teaching this morning. Traditionally and historically in Israel, in the nation of Israel, kings are appointed not to rule and to govern the people, but to fight wars, to fight battles. It's like seeing Donald Trump or seeing um, Boris Johnson move to Iraq with the British soldiers and then sitting down somewhere in the camp and fighting with them. We don't do that in this generation now, in this dispensation. But in medieval times, in historical times, kings 
followed their armies to battles and they won't go to the forefront of the battle of the battle they stay at a secure place but their presence in the battlefield is a motivation is a motivation for the army and normally when they go to war going to battles when it is raining why because they used horses and chariots in those days when you fight battles when it is raining the chances of having issues with mobility are very high the 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 the, the, the our horses the hoofs of the horses and the wheels of the chariots get stuck get stuck in the mud and so the armies will be finding it very hard to move their chariot so the best time to go to battle is in the spring when it is not raining at time so most wars are fought at that time most battles are fought at that time so that's the history behind this and listen to this in second Samuel chapter chapter 11 verse 1 Israel was engaged in a battle and typically David was supposed to follow them to fight but David did not go David stayed back David stayed back he didn't go to that battle I'm going to explain some of the issues that are behind this story and I'm building it up and I want to crave our indulgence um, to persevere with me and to endure with me. I dive into this teaching this morning, into the mainstream. While I was preparing for this message, I noticed that there is a striking parallel. David and Jesus. There is a striking parallel between David and Jesus. Jesus went to battle. Matthew chapter 4. Jesus entered into the boxing ring with Satan. Satan came to tempt Jesus. So that was a battle. That was a spiritual battle. So as I was studying this scripture, the Holy Spirit just opened up my mind and my heart and reminded me that Jesus had chapter 4. And suddenly I caught a glimpse of a light. I saw striking similarities between the experience of David in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1, and the experience of Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. Listen to this. Let me read out the parallel to you. I put them together. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. One king went to sleep. That was David. On the day of battle, the Bible says that David went to bed. He went to sleep. He didn't go. He went to sleep. In 2 Samuel 11 verse 1, one king went to sleep. In Matthew chapter 4 verse 1, another king went to battle. Number 2, the Holy Spirit led one king into the wilderness to prepare him to fight. Satan led another king into his bed to sleep. Look at the parallel between David and Jesus. The first parallel is that one king went to war, went to war, tempting period. Another king went to sleep. Number two, one king was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. Another was led by the devil to enjoy the splendor of royalty during the time of war. So let's let's stay there. I'm going to continue with the parallels now. In the day it mattered most. In the most, battle, David went to bed and sent out his armies. Joab and his armies to go and fight. I began to look at David at this stage of his life. This in our lives as well. I want you to fit yourself into the picture I want to paint. 
this young man was not even considered suitable and fit to be king. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, God spoke unto Samuel to go and anoint David. David was the last born of their father, Jesse. David was sent forth from the battle, from the wilderness, from the where he was a shepherd and was brought into the family and was ordained king. David fought with Goliath. There was no uh, nowhere before that time where it was mentioned that David went to sleep. He was always fighting. He was always proactive. He was always on his toes. David was running elder skelter from Saul. Saul put David under David was a warrior. David was a tough man. Things were not going on well. When things were very rough, David was very strong. David was very responsible. David was very sensitive. David was, he would sleep with one eye and open another eye. Then David was anointed king of Judah. Power began to come. Little influence and power. And then, typically, you will notice some adjustments. But the Bible didn't record those adjustments. But suddenly David was anointed king of the whole of Israel. So not just a city of Judah, every part of the country. After some they submitted to David. And David became their king. Suddenly, the same David that will not sleep. The same David that was always on his toes. The same David that defeated Goliath. The same David that was running from cave to cave. Sleeping on the mountains. Sleeping in the bush. The same David that was playing the violin and was so sharp that when Saul threw a javelin at close range, David was so sharp. David was so sharp that he dodged that javelin. The spiritual sensitivity was on the top, was, was, was at, the, at the forefront. The mental strength of David was at the forefront. This what going on where it was a battle ready personality david was tough or strong but as soon as power entered the hands of david and david became the king of the whole nation now when you become the president of america the president of nigeria the prime minister of great britain you enjoy certain benefits influence comes power comes ego comes money comes women come <coughs> And opportunities come. They will be begging you. You are the, you are the quintessential. You are the, you are the one everyone wants to be friend with. You have to be very careful. <laughs> I'm going somewhere. As soon as influence entered David, power entered David. A day came in the life of David when the same man that never played with battle spoke to his general. I am not going to war today. I want to rest. I want to sleep. And he sent his army, he sent them out. That incident, up to today, the world has not recovered from its consequence. It happened about 4,000 years ago. The nation of Israel has not recovered. Because that was the incident that opened the door for the fall of David. And Nathan, the prophet, placed a judgment on David. He said, the sword will not depart from your house. The sword will not depart. That spoke to war. It was telling David, from all the days of your life to your generations, they will always be in battle and warfare. The sword will not depart. That was the judgment God placed, among other judgments that God placed upon David. Today, the nation of Israel is submerged. The nation of Israel is, is surrounded by Palestine, by Iran, by Iraq, by Syria. All of them are putting their nose on the floor. They... They, there is no country on earth today that is as battle ready as the nation of Israel because they are surrounded by enemy nations who have vowed the former president of Iran he said that his destiny is to annihilate the nation of Israel and every day they are battle ready because of one man's negligence for years on the day it mattered most David went to and I was looking at this story. The same David that fought Goliath and defeated Goliath. The same David that was moving from cave to cave. 
what happened? And the Lord said to me, look at, look at it, look at this man. Many Christians, many of us, when we need God, when there is no, when there is no money, when we, when we are looking for husbands or for wives, when we are looking for a job, when we are looking for visa, we will do everything to make God happy. We will be diligent. We will fast. We will pray. We will avoid sin. We just want to appear good to God. As soon as our hands touch the sword, <laughs> as soon as our hands touch the sword, like they say in my, in my culture back home in Nigeria, when the hand of a man has not touched the sword, he won't ask for the death. That killed his father. As soon as our hands touch the sword, then we develop that boldness and we become who we are, who, who can arrest me. I can tell you stories, stories of pastors, of believers, of Christians who were very serious, who were very deeply their wives, who loved their husbands. Before that big breakthrough came, as soon as that breakthrough came, they were appointed, they gave them a contract, they gave them a job, they got a visa, they went to America and then they begin to fall down and there's this a downward it's like a downward spin and they begin to go down oh things are not are not so difficult you don't have to you don't need to pray i mean it was when i was in africa that i prayed like that prayer is not that important after all people in china are not praying and they are making it you don't need to study scripture it's not important just enjoy life and i saw the picture of a former governor in nigeria who died a few days back they buried him today I saw the picture and I nearly wept. They folded him in a mat. <laughs> this man was a billionaire. Oh my God, do we learn any lesson from death at all? This man was a billionaire, the former governor of your state in Nigeria. They wrap him, you know, Muslims, they put him on the floor, put four stones, they put a mat on him and put four stones. They just pick those stones randomly. They didn't put diamond there. They didn't pick diamond stones. They picked, go and check the picture on Facebook. They put stones on the four corner of the mat. Like they put a dead cow or a dead ram. It's like when you, when you are doing a party, your Muslims are doing their party and they slaughter a ram and they cover the, the, the carcass. I said, what? This man has houses all over the world. This man is a billionaire. This man has properties. This man wielded power. This man wielded power. But men do men don't learn lessons from death. Men will be sober for a few days, few weeks. After that, then the, the, the normal thing continues. If people remember that the day is coming when their visa card, their master card will no longer be useful, <laughs> that a day is coming when all their bank accounts with all the money will no longer be useful. If people think about that day, people will live their life differently. That was what happened to David. The same David that was very, very, very diligent, very strong man. David that will write all the Psalms. In fact, most of the Psalms that David wrote, he, he, when he was suffering, when he was in the cave, David wrote all those Psalms when he was running after the sheep in the wilderness. As soon as power came, David got to a point in his life. He stopped going to battle. I haven't started the teaching yet. I'm just building up. David stopped going to battle. Second Samuel 11 verse 1. David sent Joab, said, no, you go to war. And David went back home and slept. That was the greatest mistake of the life of David. He will be wishing in heaven now that he never did that in that day. And I was thinking, what could have caused this thing? Why did David, a man after God's heart, why did he allow himself to descend so low? Why did he allow money, influence, power to water down his love for God? I preached a message about four years ago, three years ago, for, on driven by love. There's no way by the grace of God I preach that message that God doesn't impact significantly because the message impacted me first. So one thing is this, if a message does not burn me, it won't one of the key key things every minister of God must learn. So you don't prepare messages because you want to preach. You prepare because you want to be blessed first. So it burns me first before it burns the people. So if I am not burnt, I won't preach that message. So what I do first is that I study it and I, I must learn. 
I must learn and correct myself and make sure that this message is burning me. If it burns me, I know that the Lord will burn people when they listen to it. The Lord was saying to me something one day, John chapter 21. When Peter said to the other apostles, I am going to fishing, they were frustrated. They died. They didn't know that. They were confused about their destiny. And then Peter went fishing. <laughs> Jesus appeared on the scene and he asked Peter to cast his net and Peter, well, he, he, he obeyed. After they enclosed and gathered more, the Bible said something, very profound statement. I wrote a whole book on that book. Very profound statement. That statement, if you sit down with it, I can bet it with you for the next one year. You cannot exhaust the depth of that word because one word from the Bible can transform a man's life forever. You don't need 10,000 verses of the Bible. Just sit down with one and be digging it and be digging it. What is that statement? The Bible, I think it's in verse 15, John 21. After they had eaten, Jesus said to Peter, Lovest thou me more than this? Oh my God, you don't know how powerful that statement is. Before I wrote that book, I preached in a church in Nigeria as, as, as a guest minister in 2016, or, I can't remember, 17 or 16. And they used that message as a ringtone. The pastor of the church told me he used it as a ringtone. The, the impact of that message, they have not... the Holy Spirit just blew on that script. That is how powerful the Holy Spirit can be. Don't trivialize scriptures. Don't read the Bible as a chemistry textbook. It's a book of spirits. Genesis to Revelation is a book of spirits. John 6, 63. Jesus said, the words I speak unto you are spirit and their life. So I don't just read it as if I'm reading a textbook. I read as if I'm preparing for an exam. I will, I will stay on one verse thinking and meditating for a whole week. I'm still on that one verse. After they had eaten, Jesus asked Peter, do you love me more than this? I had read that verse more than 25 years before that time. About 30 years. I've been reading it. I've just glossed through it. The Holy Spirit said, go back to that verse. My heart was just glued on it. I said, what does it mean? What does it mean? Eh? After they had eaten, the Jesus said, eh, they have eaten now. So what does it mean? The Lord said, no. Look at it. As soon as I was looking at it, and looking at it, the light just broke. After they are eating, he said, Do you know what? The best time to test a man is after pleasure. Ah, I nearly jumped out of my seat. He said, That scripture, he said, After they had eaten, Jesus asked Peter, Do you love me? He said, The best time to test your love for God is after pleasure, after that job, after that visa, after that promotion, after that baby you have been waiting for. After that beautiful woman that you have been thanking God, trusting God for. After they had eaten, after God had satisfied them and money has come. Now you are, you are a big boy. You are living in England, living in America. You are a big boy. You are handing 100,000 pounds per annum. Lovest thou me more than this? Jesus didn't ask Peter if he loved him when Peter was struggling. Because it is easier to love God when you are struggling. Very, very easy. Everybody loves God when there is trouble. <laughs> Why? Because you want God to solve your problem. Everybody loves God when there is problem. When people are sick, anything you tell them, they will do. They are vulnerable. Anything you tell them, they will do. Can you fast for 40 days? I will fast. Can you do this? I will do it. You, there is somebody who offended you 10 years ago. Can you forgive him? I will forgive him. If you don't forgive him, you will die. Oh, I, I will forgive him. You will do anything they tell you to do. When things are bad and you need a solution, when people are desperate and their backs have hit the wall, you will do anything you are told to do. So Jesus didn't ask Peter that question when they had crisis, when there was no fish, when there was no when there was there was there was no problem. Sorry, when there was problem, he knew Peter would say yes, yes, I love you, I love you. Jesus waited for them to eat. They ate nice dish and said, mm -hmm. "Now you have eaten. Do you love me?" Ah. The Lord said, the best time I test my people is after they have eaten. And the Lord said, I have given food. I have given fishes to so many people. God has opened doors for you. God has before, before that breakthrough came. You knew how much, 
how hot your love was for God. You knew that you won't compromise. The same thing applies to ministers of God, preachers. I know a Nigerian preacher, very famous pastor. One of his friends went to him sometimes last year, two years ago. He called him by his first name. He didn't even call him bishop or evangelist. He called him by his first name. He said to him, he said, you are not like this in 1978. You are not like this. You, are, you trained us. You taught us. This is not what you are preaching. What happened to you? And the big man they just smiled. You know, money has come. He just smiled. Oh, you know. When money is not in your pocket, and you love it is easy to love. After the Lord said, Do you love me? Pro and it reopened, it transformed my mind from that day. So anytime I get a blessing, I get a breakthrough, I'm very careful. I'm very careful. I, my prayer time doesn't reduce. One hour, it will never reduce. I, I became more conscious because I knew that God was checking me. <laughs> he was checking me. And that is the reason why many people will be praying and praying and praying and praying and praying for a particular thing and God will not answer that prayer. Because God knows his love for me will dry up. This boy doesn't love me for who I am. He only loves me for what he want to get from me. If I open this door, if I open it, he will. And so you are praying for the same thing, praying for the same thing, and things are, are dragging and dragging. And you know, that I talked about this about four weeks ago. When you are praying about something, you are not getting an answer. No, sometimes it's not Satan, it's not demon. Check your love for God. Check your stand with Christ. God may be training you that you're not equipped yet. You're not ready yet for this thing. That was what happened to David. Before David became king, he was top. He was, he was at the very top. He was, he was fighting. The David will sleep in his house. David, he won't try it. He was jumping from pit. So jumping from cave to pit because of Saul. Saul was... Saul was chasing him night and day. But as soon as power came, money came. Second Samuel 11 verse 1. On the day they needed David most, the day of battle, David stayed back at home and went to bed. When kings go to sleep, David went to bed and sent Joab and the other army, sent them to war. Ah, may you not be at home on a wrong day in the name of outside may you not be at home and when you are supposed to be at home may you not be outside may you be at the wrong place even time location is one of the critical pillars of destiny fulfillment a lot of people that died untimely didn't plan to die they found themselves in the wrong place about five or six years ago there was a plane crash in nigeria there was a plane crash in nigeria that I, I think I cried because it was one woman was on the queue. The queue was building up when they were buying the ticket for that flight. And one woman was on the queue. She was on the queue. <laughs> and it was almost getting to her turn. I think it was her turn. Two Chinese men, they just came from outside and went directly to the desk. And the woman said, ah, and the people on the desk began to attend to the woman. The woman, sorry, I mean, attend to the men, to the, to the two Chinese men. The woman just yelled, say, what is going on here? Oh, this is why, why Nigeria is what it is. Oh, you people, how can you leave me on the queue? She was ranting. She was, she wasn't, she was very angry. I've been staying on the queue for the past. What's going on here? Because these guys are Chinese? Because they are white people? Those ladies on the counter, they ignored her. They sold the ticket to the Chinese. The Chinese, according to the news, the story, the Chinese people looked back on the woman on the queue and waved the ticket in mockery. I'm quoting that report verbatim now. They waved it, looked at her in mockery. They didn't know they were, they were waving the ticket of death. The people that sold the ticket for them and the people that fight, the woman collapsed when she had it. She went, she said she went on the floor. She collapsed. Ah, she collapsed. Say, ah, Lord, have mercy on me. I'm sorry. Ah, 
she collapsed <laughs> to be in the wrong place at the wrong time or in the wrong place and what are right or wrong time don't be in the wrong place there are sometimes God will have mercy on people even when people are stuck prevent those things from happening we have all been there I've been there many times and when I'm stubborn I'm, I'm, I'm disobedient <laughs> But the best place to be is to ensure that you are always prayerful and you are careful. Do not be in a wrong place at the wrong or right time. David stayed back at home on the day it mattered most and he destroyed himself. David destroyed himself. He didn't just destroy himself. Thousands of generations after that thing happened 4,000 years ago till today, the nation of Israel has not recovered. And I began to think about this issue. Why did David do this? Number one, arrogance and pride. According to my research, anytime kings go to war in those days, because kings always, the purpose of kingship wasn't just to be ruling people. You have to go to war. Part of the reasons the, 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 the people are crying for a king. They told God, they told Samuel, we want a king that will go to war like other nations. So the kings wouldn't just sit down in the palace. The kings must go and armies to war. But when they go to, to the war, they don't enjoy the comforts in the battlefield. So they have to sit in tents. They have to sit under the forest in the bush. So David was not comfortable with that again. They had been enjoying the pleasure of the palace. So pride and arrogance was burning in. Let's go. <laughs> pride and arrogance, number one. Number two, I can't, because of my time, I, I can't go into it. Power. Power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Don't say, I can never do it. You can do it. <laughs> I can do it. Me, I can never be proud. Ah, <laughs> just trust the grace of God. Just trust the grace of God. And that is the way I live my life. There is nothing bad I cannot do without God's grace. Without God's grace. <laughs> So I don't trust my strength. I don't trust my energy. I don't trust my faithfulness. I have, I have put my strength, my trust in God. So, I mean, uh, Paul, Paul was telling the, I think the Ephesians, he said, be strong in the Lord. Not in yourself now. He said, be strong in, in the Lord and in the power of his mind. So put your trust in him. So I don't take stupid chances. I don't take chances that I'm strong man. <laughs> so people have done that and they have beaten their fingers very, very badly. Power. Number two. Prosperity is more dangerous than poverty. I just explain now. Poverty is very horrible. Prosperity is worse. It's more dangerous. You will see that the things people never dreamt they would do before money came. When money comes, they begin to think about it. I want to go to Hawaii. I want to go to um, um, Vegas, Las Vegas. I don't want to go with anyone. I want to go and have a retreat there. You want to have a retreat. <laughs> there was a time some pastors in Nigeria were going to America for retreat and they would go with their secretaries. <laughs> with their secretaries. And they left their wife back home. So don't know, we have a conference in wherever we go. And most of them, not even most, all of those guys that did that thing, they were sleeping, they were sleeping with their secretaries that time. They were sleeping with them. They were doing it. Now, you want to do a retreat. You can't do retreats in your room, in your house. Now, because why? 20 years before that time, the guy didn't have money. Well, now he has a lot of money. I can't pray in my house. I can't pray in this place. I want to go to a, a, a resort in Las Vegas for a retreat. And when you go there, you see naked women dancing around. That is what prosperity does. So that's where people have to be broken before money comes to their hand. Oh, I'm earning 1,000 pounds per month. I'm earning 1,005. You don't have money yet, though. There are some months that when they come and you are not prepared by God, it will shake your faith. <laughs> mammon is horrible. One day I was talking to a man of God. I said, ordinary mammon. He said, what do you mean? He said, you call mammon ordinary. <laughs> he said, ordinary. I just said the child. I said, ordinary mammon. He said, well, you don't know what money he is. So I can never do it. It's not in my dictionary. Lord, I trust your grace. Just please help me. I don't trust this flesh. I don't trust this flesh. So I am always a step ahead of it in my spirit. I put necessary precautionary measure around myself. Even though I make mistakes as well as a human being. 
Number four, burn out and battle weariness affected David. He had been fighting and running from Saul for years. For years, for like 10, 11 years. He was weary and said, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to battle today. I want to sleep. Please, Joab, go. Just leave me alone. I want to sleep, please. Hmm. On the day it mattered most, may you be sensitive to the voice of the Spirit. Anytime you don't feel like praying, that is the best time to pray. Go and ask any intercessor, anyone who prays. Anytime you don't feel like, you don't have to spend five hours, two hours, one hour. Just 10 minutes. Just be praying the Holy Spirit. Even if you are very weak and tired, when I'm weak and tired, I just lay on the, on the bed. I just whisper. I just worship. I just, just pull yourself through because somebody's life might depend on it. In fact, your own life might depend on it. You might depend on it. Anytime you are weary and you are even if you are physically weary, maybe fever or whatever, or you are tired, and you, you know you should pray at that time, but you don't feel like praying. So, Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus. And just worship. Look for a music. Look for a song. Look for a worship song and play it. And before you say Jack, 10, 15, 20 minutes, your spirit man will, will come alive. And you can pray a few minutes and then you can go to bed. So, let's now go back to the parallels I was building. Um, um, and don't forget, I began by drawing a parallel. Parallel between Jesus and David. If you look at Matthew chapter 4, you will see Jesus. Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to fight a battle. He fought a battle. He fought with Satan. <laughs> Satan came to tempt him. And I saw a striking parallel. Similarity between what Jesus experienced and what David experienced in 2 Samuel chapter 11. Let me read out the parallel again. Satan led a king into a tender of royalty at the time of war. The Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to prepare him in fasting and prayer. That is fast. Satan led Jesus to the top of the mountain. Listen to this. Satan also led David to the top of his house. Satan showed Jesus the glory of the world. Satan showed David the glory of Bathsheba. Satan lured Jesus to lust after the glory of the world. Satan lured David to lust after the glory and beauty of Bathsheba. Jesus rejected the offer. David accepted the offer. Jesus returned with power. David returned with trouble. <laughs> now listen to this. The most important part of this lesson is this. Timing and location. Timing. Is there anything wrong in sleeping? No! Is there anything wrong in resting? No, but kings don't sleep in the time of war. Kings don't sleep in the time of war. Let me say something here. David was a physical king. You and I are spiritual kings. Revelation chapter 1 verse 6 and Revelation chapter 5 verse 10, the Bible says he has made us kings and priests. So you are a king. I am a king. Jesus is our king because Jesus is the king of kings. So every one of us in Christ Jesus, we are kings. We are kings. So we don't go to sleep on the day of battle. Number two, in the, in the physical, during the time of David, they had specific times of the year where they fought battles. Maybe a spring, maybe a particular day. In the, in the spiritual realm that you and I are living now, every day is a day of battle. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against 
principalities and against powers. So, in the time of David, things were even easier because they had a specific time to go to battle, which explains the reason why God was very angry with David. You could have slept at any other time. This is just once in a year. After the battle, you can rest. <laughs> David's time and David's era was even easier. It's easier. Our era is more difficult because in this era, you have to be ready every minute, every second. You and I are at war every day, every hour. There is no day of rest spiritually. Physically, you can rest, but spiritually, there is no day of rest. You have to be on your toes every day. The Bible says, our adversary, First Peter chapter 5, verse 18, I think, our adversary, the enemy, he goes about seeking whom he may devour. It goes about every minute. So you cannot say, for the next three days, I want to rest spiritually. You don't rest spiritually. <laughs> you don't rest spiritually. You can rest physically. Your spirit man must be alive at every time. Every time. So you are a king. I am a king. In the olden days, they had a time of war. Today, every day is a time of war. Every day is a time of war. One minute of spiritual carelessness can cost a man his destiny. One minute of spiritual laziness. One minute. <clears throat> I think I've shared this story before. There is this pastor, a Nigerian pastor, many, many years back. It was a long time ago. Maybe like 40 years about, or longer than that. He was a very anointed prophet. I've shared his story sometimes before. Very anointed. He, he operated at the same level of Babalola of those days, of, of the CAC movement. Very anointed man of God. So, all the witches and wizards in the city, they were looking for him. They did everything to get him. They, did, they, did, they didn't succeed. He will be praying for hours. He will go to crusades. There will be healing. All the people they tie down, he will wake all of them up. Please. They couldn't stand the light and the power of God on his life. In fact, many of them were dying. Let's wear him out. Come back to life. And uh, thank you, Daddy. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. The same thing repeated itself again. It's always happening anytime the man returned from his crusade. It always happens. Now, when, you, when you finish preaching, you have ex, ex, I mean, exp, expanded spirit. So most, most times, Satan wants to attack pastors after they have finished a major program. So this thing continued. The Baba did not sense something was going on wrong. This lady is always collapsing, always fainting. He, he didn't get anything. He did that thing several times. And in their, in their meeting, they said, don't rush him. Don't rush him. Let's do it stage by stage. Let's wear him out. One day, the Baba went for a very powerful crusade. He came out and he was tired. Came back. And the same episode repeated itself again. You know what? They didn't call, send someone to go and call Baba. The lady herself went to Baba's house and pretended as if she collapsed and she fainted on the floor. Fainted on the floor in front of Baba's door and banged the door. Baba, Baba, Baba. The man of God had removed his clothes. He was having a bath. He just came from a big crusade. As soon as Baba came out, the lady was on the floor. Baba bent down to pray because Baba was just using his, his towel. He was not wearing any clothes. The lady jumped up on the floor and grabbed Baba. Right there, Baba slept with her. Right there. There was wild jubilation. In the kingdom of darkness. After that experience, Baba was afflicted. With died shortly after that time. That was how they captured that man. They said, "Don't rush in. Let us wear him out spiritually." 
Let's we are, you can't attack him with money. He won't steal money. You can't attack him with adultery. He won't do it. You can't attack him with pride. He's a very humble man. Let's wear him out. They spend months. Months. If you are in Christ Jesus, the Bible says, we are not ignorant of the devil's devices. Satan's strategy 101 is deception and ignorance. Deception. And that is his number one strategy. And he has used it time and again. Time, and he keeps working. It keeps working and people keep falling and he keeps using it. Deception and ignorance. He makes sure that he pretends as if nothing is wrong with you. What is wrong in not praying in a month? All you religious people, why should I be praying every day? That was not what you were saying before, <laughs> before money came. When you are praying to God to give you visa, I want to go to America, I want to go to America. You are fasting and praying. Now you are in the US now, you don't pray at all. And then you are now explaining it away. After all, people don't pray in Ghana, in Germany, and they have built the biggest industry. Hmm. Satan is working gradually on you. Satan is a gradualist. He can wait for a man for 20 years. And that is where you find a pastor will tell you, I don't have any conviction in me again that my wife is my wife. We have irreconcilable differences. I can't just stay married to her. My secretary... That was what a pastor told a pastor close to me in Europe. In Europe, about, about three years ago, my secretary, my, sorry, my, my choir leader is the one I, I love. But why didn't you marry the choir leader before? Did your wife commit adultery? No. What did she do? She's not helping my ministry. She's attacking my ministry spiritually. I have to divorce her. And the man divorced his wife. He pastor, if this man was red hot before. He would never dream he would do that 10 years ago. But he was very gradual. That is why Paul said in Ephesians 6, 12, for we resu not against flesh and blood. It is resu, not resu, not past tense. It's present tense. It's present continuous. It's a daily affair. Make sure you don't trivialize your spirituality. The Bible says to be carnally minded is death. Don't trivialize it. No matter the amount of money you have, influence, no matter how busy you are, like I always say, everyone will always make time for whatever is his priority. If God is your priority, you will make time for him. No matter, if you are starting work at 7 in the morning and you have to drive or drive to work by 6, you wait by 4 o'clock and give God 30 minutes or 1 hour. If God is the priority, you will make time for him. There is nothing in this world that people can't make time for. If it is their priority. If you consider God as important, you will find time for him. There is no man, there is nothing called I'm busy. Nobody is busy until they have problems. You will know when people have problems. You will know when people are busy. You, you, you won't know that people have time until they have problems. They will abandon what they are doing when they have problems. And will be looking for solution anywhere they can get it. <laughs> Including rich people. That was what finished David. Thank God for the mercies of God on David. But David never remained the same again. 4,000 years after, we are still saying it today. The memory of David is still tainted. The memory of David is still tainted with the story of Bathsheba. Because it was a king that slept in the time of battle. A king that slept in the time of battle. We don't have times of battle in the New Testament. Every day is a day of battle. Every minute is a minute of battle. Every time is crucial. There is no better time to pray. There is no appropriate time. It is now. It is now. Let me tell you something. As I round up. I'm going to give you four strategies. Yes, four, four things that should guide you, that will help. And I'm, I'm speaking to myself as well. David contracted his prayer, sorry, his battle to his general. Go and fight for me. I want to stay at home. You know, there are some Christians who have people who pray for them. They pay them to pray. They pay them to pray. There are some Christians whose trust is in their pastor, whose trust is in their mentor. And they don't pray. They don't study, 
They call the man of God, they send money to him. Please, sir, pray for me. My marriage, sir, pray for me. My job, please pray for me. My health, they don't do it. It is the most expensive thing anyone can do in this world. No one can pray for you better than yourself. And that statement is contextual. I am not saying that people don't carry greater anointing. I'm saying the passion, the dedication, the faithfulness of praying for yourself is, uh, is, is stronger with you than with another person. Somebody else will pray for you for five minutes and spend time to pray for his own family for the rest three hours. Remaining three hours. Comfort over your life. You can ask people to help you to join their faith with yours. You can have someone to pray for you, but not pray for you in terms of replacing your own prayer life. You are only as strong as your prayer life. No man is greater than his prayer life. Because prayer itself is battlefield. David contracted his battle to someone else and he fell flat on his face. He fell flat. He fell flat. God said, you have done what you have done in the secret. Your wives will be defiled in the open by your children. The sword will not depart from your house. The judgment God placed upon David till today, the nation of Israel has not recovered from it. The sword has not departed from the house of Israel. They are fighting battles every day. Go, just Google how many wars, how many battles does Israel fight? Palestinians are there. Hamas is there. Al-Qaeda is there. ISIS is there. The Iranians are there. The Syrians are there. The Iraqis are there. They are, they are all bombarding them. <laughs> bombarding because of the carelessness of the king. You are a king in the spirit. Revelation 1 verse 6. Verse 6, yes. You are a king. Like I said last Sunday, God has raised you and I and equipped us so that our generation, our children, will not fight our battles. There are some parents, they are reserving battles for their children. <laughs> I had a story of a man, very old man, about 85 years old. He said he wanted to buy a very, very good car, brand new car. He had a good car he was driving, and his friend asked him, in Nigeria, how will you get money? He said, I'll go and borrow the money to buy a brand new car. And the friend asked him, who will pay? He said, my children will pay. You can't imagine that. My children will pay. I want to go into debt and then leave the debt to my children to pay. Don't leave battles. Let, let your children fight their own battles. Don't add battle to battle. Don't add battle to battle. Make sure that you pray them into their calling. Pray them to their destinies. Win some battles for them. Make their own life easier. They will still fight their own battles. Forget it. Every generation will always have its own unique battles. In their own time, they will still fight their own battles. But there is a way a parent can prepare the ground and make it softer. Make it softer for them. So that when they are fighting, they can leverage on the victories of their parents and use that as weapons of victory in their own war as well. Don't employ prayer contractors. Fight as a king. Number two, David went to bed in the noonday. If you read that scripture, Second Samuel chapter 11, verse 2, in the Amplified and Good News Bible, it was in the noonday. That's profound. Don't go to bed in the noonday. You know what the noonday is? The noonday is the brightest part of a man's life. The noonday is is the time when battles are the are the are the, are, are the most are the strongest and toughest level if you read psalm 91 and psalm 90 the bible speaks about the destructions that wait at noonday the noonday is the peak of achievement the noonday the noonday is the peak of strength the noonday is a stage in a man's life or in a woman's life when you have worked, you have labored, and your star is just shining. It's like you have gone to school, you finished your studies, you've just got a job, your first job, you are in your first year of work. The brightest part of your day, all the time your business is just booming, all the time your children are just growing, and they are getting, they are graduating from universities. So the noonday in the Bible is very prophetic. 
the noonday. That is when the sun shines the brightest. And Satan sometimes waits for people. In the morning, he won't attack them. It is in the noonday. The noonday. Because he knows that when he shoots at them in the noonday, the impact is more severe. The impact is more severe. When you attack a 95-year-old man, he will just be laughing at you. He's closer to the grave. But the attack that comes on the 25-year-old young man is always stronger. Because at that age, you are in your noonday, the peak of strength. That was the time David went to sleep. <laughs> there are some people, they don't want to pray now. They want to pray when problem comes. That is foolishness. The Bible says, do not forget the Lord your God in the day of your youth. Do not forget the Lord your God in the noonday. Make a when the sun shines. Where you can pray now. When you can fast now. When you can worship now. When your eyes are sharp now. When you can read 10 books in a year now. This is the noon day. This is not the time for kings to go to bed. This is the time for kings to be fully awake. Because a time is coming. You will never be at the same level of physical strength. A 95 year old man is not the same as a 30 year old man. Your strength may wane, may wane. Your capacity, your mental capacity may wane. The older we are, the more tardy, the slower we will Old men don't run the passing a man at 75. And you have what is your vision? I want to enroll in the Olympics and I want to run 100 meters. That is that is that is uh, ridiculous. Because his time has passed. Have you ever met a man who is 75 years old and he said he wants to go and enroll? With Chelsea, I want to play with Chelsea, and yes, it's faster than praying. I want to play with if Chelsea doesn't take me, man, you will take me. If man, you doesn't take me, Real Madrid will take me. How old are you, sir? I'm 75 years old. Age is not age, age is just number. And when you go for training, you will know if age is number or not. When you go for training, you will know if age is number or not. When they send a long pass to you and <laughs> And see Ronaldo is beside you and is asking you to take the ball and give it to him. And you mess everything up. You will know the crowd on the stadium will jump on the field at you and they will beat you up mercilessly. Old men don't play football. Football is for youth. The noonday is trash. I said, well, how would they be sleep on the noonday? How would a king, a lot of kings are sleeping now? Believers. Because you and I are kings. First Samuel, second son, I mean, um, the book of Revelation chapter 1 verse 6. We are kings. You are not ordinary. You are a king. Jesus has made you a king and a priest. You can't sleep. You cannot sleep. Jesus told the apostles to say, walk while it is day. The night comes when no one can walk. I can't be preaching. I can't be doing it. There are some people, which is when they are closer to their grave, they will be regretting. I wish I had. I wish I had. I, I should have. I like, I, very few in your dictionary. I should have. I think I should have. The more of those words in a man's dictionary, the more miserable that person is going to be at the end of his life. Because that person will have catalogs of unfulfilled dreams. That won't be your portion in Jesus' name. David slept as a king in the noonday. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. Do not be ignorant of the devil's devices. Satan loves the noonday. I mean, I may have to do a teaching on this particular thing. Satan loves the noonday. Ah, he loves it so much. The noonday is very sweet to him. Very sweet. Because that is what brings the, the sharpest pain. To the heart of people. And that is why God is telling you and I this morning. That we must make sure we make a when the sun shines. Do not say I still have more time. I can do anything I like. Make the most of what you have now. When you have the energy and you have the strength to pray 20 minutes. Don't be sleeping and be watching movie and you are on the internet, on Instagram for hours and hours. And you cannot even remember how many times you spend 10 minutes. 
interrupted 10 minutes in prayer, praying for your country, praying for your, your praying for your children, and it's not the hours now, it's the dedication. You can pray for one hour and you are praying erroneously. You're just asking for biblical. You can stand before God for 10 minutes and he's eating the targets and eating the target and shooting arrows that are eating targets because he's praying passionately. The Bible said the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. He didn't say the effectual longest prayer of a righteous man. So spending time with God is very critical, but it's not the priority. Make sure it is of quality, qualitative first before quantitative. It is deep, it is effective, it is fervent. And then you cannot do it for as many times, as much hours or minutes you are graced to do. Don't go to bed in the noon. Don't go to bed. You are a king. Jesus has made us a king. You are a king. And I'm saying this generically. Women too are kings. We are all kings in Christ. Don't go to bed in noonday. Number three. The first one is don't contract prayer to anyone. Or your spiritual development. I think I should address something. It just dropped my spirit. There's a man of God I have great respect for, and I love him. Uh, brother's heir. We understand what I'm talking about. And he says something that I have, I have addressed that thing some time ago. But I saw a lot of people arguing back and forth on it yesterday. And he said that if you want to succeed in life, and you want to get certain results in life, you have to connect with the with the covenant that a man of God has with God. You have a covenant with God, covenant of whatever, maybe prosperity. Or if that, if you connect with that man, and then you give that man, maybe you plant a seed, and then that man can impact that covenant he has with God on you, and that thing will give you success in what you are praying for. That's an error. I love this man of God and I respect him. But I see things that he's still being pulled left, right, and center. He wants to detach himself from these wrong teachings, but because of the people that, that surround him. That is the very reason why I am very careful the kind of pastors I relate with. I love everyone, but I don't relate with everybody. When you are in Christ Jesus, there is only one covenant. The issue of covenant is only relevant in the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 8 verse 20 says, If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. What the Bible teaches is that grace is in degrees. Covenant is not in degree. There is only one covenant. The Bible says in James 4 verse 6, God resists the proud, but gives more grace to the humble. God resists the proud, but gives more more in this grace is in degrees and we can't rewrite the scripture even if i don't like that verse i can't it's not what i like now if god can give people more grace it means i can have less you can have more because you are humble so the humbler you are the more of god's grace and what is grace grace in greek is charisma charisma is power empowerment so god will empower you in a particular area of your calling more than someone else because you are humble before God. That is to Timothy. I am in part to you. We can't read the Bible. Paul said it. I am coming to impart. Paul again said, He said, The gift that has been given to Timothy, Timothy, by the laying on of hands, Timothy should tear them up by prayer. So some people lay hands on Timothy and imparted some gift. You can transfer unction. As people can transfer evil spirits, people that carry demons, if they lay hands on you, they can transfer demons to you. That's why I, you can't catch me drinking and eating anything I see. I don't drink communion everywhere. If I don't know, I have to know you very well. The time we are living in now is so dangerous. When I'm talking like this, I'm talking because I'm very careful. The time we are living now is dangerous. So there is no, no matter how powerful that pastor is, I respect it. You cannot give me communion or anointing or, and I will take it from you. If I don't know you, I have to know you to your house. 
I have to have entered your room. So I place a ban on it. You won't understand what I'm saying until you meet me privately and I tell you the things that I've seen and that I've heard from trusted pastors. That is not contested. You can't contest it. I resist the proud, but I give more grace or higher grace to who is humble. If God can give higher grace, it means grace is in level. So we have to understand scripture before we argue around some things. That is the Bible. But there is only one covenant. No other personal covenant between people and God. That is invalidated. Jesus has offered a one-time sacrifice that it's set aside the old covenant of Moses and Abraham and has elevated the covenant of his blood that by the remission of without the sins without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sins Hebrews 10 14 says by one offering perfected forever they that have been sanctified he didn't say he has perfected in phases or in stages so what you are saying is that if i pastor are you now i have been working with god for 40 years for 40 years and god has prospered me i have businesses as a pastor i have a school i have this and things are working for me financially someone else is a younger pastor is just starting ministry and he has been praying he has been trying to start a business things are not working I will tell him it is because you are not connected to my covenant. I have a covenant to be prosperous with God. So I have a covenant to be prosperous with God. Other people who are equally saved in Christ have covenant to be poor in God. That is that is that is just I because I have been in ministry for 40 years. I have a covenant of protection with God. Anywhere I travel to, God will save me because God called me. And he asked me, my son, I want to sign a covenant of protection with you. So other Christians can die when they travel on the road. Can you, can you, can you imagine this? That is what that man is teaching. And you can see people shouting and screaming. And what that thing does is that it will shift people's focus from Christ. And it will, it will turn people to worship man, human worship. And those people will abuse those people eventually because they will tell them, go and bring your salary. Go and bring your car. Go and bring your house. And then that house will connect to my grace. You can give people anything you are led to give by God. And stop to give. You can give, you can show your house, you can do anything you like. Which is not doctrine. That God told me to do it doesn't mean that is principle of his word. That is my personal revelation. It will work for me. I won't go on the altar and tell everybody, if you want to prosper, give me your house. If you want to do, give me your house. You want to have safe delivery as a woman, you are pregnant, give me your house. You want to have, get a visa, give me your house. I have a covenant of visa procurement grace. Because God called me, that is madness. I will destroy a whole generation with lies and errors. <laughs> there is nothing I cannot give if God tells me to do it and I have it. And I'm, I am one of the most, one of the craziest giver in the world to the glory of God. I'm not boasting. To the glory of God. The people who know me, they know that. So if you are not close to me, you think that doesn't give. Doesn't give. <laughs> I won't say more than that until you talk to people who know me close. So I'm not talking about giving now. I'm not talking about it. I'm talking about the word of God. I'm teaching the truth of the word. There is a difference between personal revelation and corporate doctrine. Corporate doctrine are rooted in the word. There are no multitude, multiplicity of covenants. We have only one covenant in Jesus. God can call a man and give him instruction and give him message and give him ideas. That is his own message and revelation. Every other believer should go to Christ and collect their own. And every revelation we collect individually must be consistent with the written word. Otherwise, it is not from God. To the law and to the prophet, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Isaiah 8 verse 20.
So the Holy Spirit just wants me to strengthen that. Honor people that are above you. Respect your pastor. Give to them. Support them. Love them. But your ultimate allegiance is to Christ. There are no multiple covenants. We have only one covenant. The whole book of Hebrew is devoted to covenant. The covenant of his blood. Superior covenant. Everlasting covenant. Eternal covenant. That is what is there. God does not create separate covenant with people in the New Testament. It is error. It is a fraud. It is a lie. Only one in the Old Testament. Moses has his own covenant. Abraham had a covenant. Jacob had a covenant. Isaac, and God will do it individually. God has marched everything together and he has buried them inside Christ. You want to sign a covenant with God? It is now Jesus' death on the cross, finished work of Christ. That is the only acceptable covenant with God. I didn't say the Bible says that. So, is it working? I, I sold my house and I gave it to, and that covenant worked for me. Sometimes it works. Because God wants to honor his name. And sometimes it doesn't work. And sometimes it works because Satan is the one working it. Because <laughs> sometimes some people that say that they have a covenant with God, they actually have a covenant with Satan. Based on what I have seen and I have heard. So they will manipulate that thing to work so that they can perpetuate error. And others will believe in it and be doing it. Because God will never honor his word, honor any man above his word. No matter who that man is. No matter who that man is. God will never honor anybody above his word. He said, I have exalted my word above my name. Why will he now allow a man, human being, to be above his word? When he himself says, my name is below my word. Can you imagine that? God Almighty will not exalt a human being above his word. This has nothing to do with giving people money. Give people, make sure you help people, help the needy, help the fatherless, help your pastor, support their project as much as you are led by God. God will bless you and honor you for it. But do not create a separate covenant between yourself and a pastor. It is an occultic covenant. God is not there. The covenant that's acceptable is between you and God through Christ Jesus alone and his death and resurrection. I have less than how many minutes now? Listen to this. You must not... Let's come out to David. When kings go to bed. I have one more point and then we are done. You must not expose yourself to avoidable and unwarranted temptations. Stop temptation at all costs. Don't deceive yourself. Don't underestimate the capacity of the flesh to crash under the weight of temptation. I am a strong man. Hmm. Put your body under. Listen to Paul. 1 Corinthians 9.27 but I keep under my body and bring it to subjection. I bring my body to subjection. Paul didn't say, God, come and do it for me. You put... So you're watching a program on the TV and you see two women, a man and a woman, they strip themselves naked. Oh, I'm a child of God. I'm a new creature. That is what it means to put your body. You, you, you force your body to behave. No, I can't watch this. Oh, God, come and help me change my TV. God, come and help me stop that program. Now, God will send an angel. God will send angel Gabriel to take the remote and press the remote and change it. That is what many Christians are doing. Say, my, it's not me. My spirit is weak. You are, it's, it is an abuse on redemption to say that the flesh is above the spirit. Because your spirit man is stronger than your flesh. That is why you have to be feeding your spirit man. So that on the day it matters most, it won't disappoint you. And you'll be very weak because you have been feeding your spirit. Sorry, feeding your flesh and starving your spirit. Put your body under. David just went to the top of his house. And he was walking around. Walking around. And he saw a beautiful woman. Why did he stop and look again? At the instance when he saw that woman, David of four people. He should have said, what's going on here? No. And then you should have left. He stayed there and looked again and looked again and looked. So I have that principle. I don't trust my flesh. So if you if you if you can live like that and just I'm, it's just an advice I'm giving. I mean I know we are we are all wise and we have different methods that we use. But make sure you don't trust your flesh. Don't trust it. And this doesn't have to do with 
sexual morality alone, anything, finances. Don't expose yourself to things that are avoidable. Don't tempt God. Don't say, God will help me. No. Most people who say regretted it eventually. Because this flesh is so much unpredictable. You see the most anointed part. Even that I even afraid to call his phone, call his number. They will be talking and insulting him on Facebook because the man trusted his flesh. I know me, I cannot fall. I will not fall. I cannot fall. I said I have only one thing to say. I forgot that I omitted one of the points. I'm sorry. David went to the roof of his house. You know, that was what actually finished David. When he woke up from his sleep, he went to the roof of his house. And I was asking the Holy Spirit, what does this mean? Don't forget that Satan took Jesus also to the roof, <laughs> to the top. The Lord said to me, that is something that happens in the heart of every man. When you have achieved something, when you have achieved a success, you just got a visa, you just got a very beautiful job, you just got a big contract, something that others don't have, and you will now climb to the roof of that success. You climb to the roof. Meaning that in your heart, you rise up in your heart and say, I, I see where I am now. Why did David go to the roof? So that when he is on the roof, he will see other people on the floor. Because when you are on the roof of your house, you are in the, on, in the penthouse. You will see other houses, small houses. And then that breeds pride. Say, look at me. Ah, see what I've achieved. And then you begin to adulate and celebrate yourself. And that is called pride. Ah, that was what finished Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar said, ah, look at this kingdom that I built for myself. Look at this kingdom. I have done it in my power. And God said, ah, this man needs to learn lesson for seven years. The same thing held in the, in the book of Acts. It is the voice of God and not of a man. He in his chair and he was reveling in the glory of his kingdom. That is pride. We don't do that now. We... But in our heart, we do it. You just achieve something and people are celebrating you. And I get messages in my inbox. Yesterday, again, I got two. People will be writing me. They will be praising me. They will be... I will not read those comments. Sometimes I just gloss through them. Next day, of God. Grace. God is the giver of the grace. I am just a servant. Because I know what prayer can do. I know what I know people who began very well and they are dead now. They are faced, they are walking around, but they are dead because pride has killed them. I know what praises can do. Is it bad to appreciate people? No. But when they are appreciating you, make sure that you turn the glory back to God. Don't touch his glory. You don't have to be a pastor. Anything you are doing in your place of work, whatever you are doing, make sure you I'm not saying that when you're talking to your boss in the meeting. And, you, and then you'll be quoting scripture in, you, in the meeting. The people in the meeting, they are not Christians. But make sure when you are in the corner of your heart, you don't allow those praises and appreciation to get to you. And you feel big. That was the beginning of the fall of David. It was the mercy of God that brought David back. But what David suffered, Absalom, Adonijah, David raised all kinds of children that became rebels. Those children tormented David. They slept with David's wife publicly. Absalom, Adonijah, they became they, they became enemies. They were fighting with David. Imagine your own son. David went through air. David didn't die a happy man. He was so sick that they brought a woman to David. And they covered David with that woman to give him it. The Bible says, and David could not know her. The same David that went to the rooftop to look at Bathsheba. They now brought the meat. The meat he loved. They brought it to, her, to him. It was like this. <laughs> he died a very sad man. His children took the kingdom from him. The children lay and slept with his wife in his lifetime. He was sick physically. All kind of problems. And he died at 70. David was one of the youngest people that... One of the people that, that died the earliest in the Bible. One of the people that loved God, that served God. That, that, look at Moses. Moses died at 120. 
Daniel died at 1, 115 or, the, or thereabouts. David at 70. So it's not, it's beyond God will forgive me. Thank God for his forgiveness. But the consequences can be dire. Avoid pride. Don't expose yourself to avoidable temptation. Make sure you don't contract your spiritual growth to people. Develop yourself. It's your own responsibility. And don't trust your flesh. When you do all of these things, and then with the grace of God, there is no temptation that is coming that will pull you down. You can predict and you can prepare ahead by the grace and the help of God. Nobody can destroy me because I'm in Christ. But you don't fold your arms and expect Jesus to do all of the work. We have a lot of work to do. That's not salvation to what Jesus has done on the cross. He's saying there are things you have to do to stay spiritually fit. Salvation is a one-time experience. You can't improve on it, but there are things you need because when you give your life to Christ, you don't die the same day. If the purpose of salvation is heaven, the day we died, we just, we, the, way we, the day we accept Jesus, we just die and go to heaven. But God will leave us around for 80 years because he wants us to possess the world for in the earth for him and spread his influence and win souls and help humanity. But to survive that 80, 90 years, you need to work out. You need to work hard. It's tough. That is why they go and collect camps because they know that they cannot survive it in their way and get some charms and do some things to equip charm we are to a close. I believe God has spoken to us this morning and we are blessed. Please, if you've been blessed, kindly help me share this teaching. It's going to encourage and fire up someone. If you are free this afternoon, I want to ask that we join you join me on 32fm.com.ng 32fm.com.ng I am teaching a very debatable contentious subject. The errors and extremes of material prosperity. And we have 30 minutes on the radio because it's quite very expensive. Uh, trusting God for finances and helps to be able to continue. The teachings I will do for two hours. I am doing them for 30 minutes. So it's very difficult. But the Lord has been helping me. So I just eat those points and eat them. I, I, and by the grace of God, God has been using that teaching to change and to impact so many people. And I'm dealing with eight different errors in the body of Christ. You will be mightily blessed. Eight very... I touched on the issue of seed, sacrifice, all those. I touched on them. And those things that people are afraid to touch, I touched on them. In the light of scriptures, you'll be mightily blessed. If you're in the UK, it's going to start by 7.30, between 7.30 and 8 p.m. 32fm.com.ng www.32fm.com.ng You are in... In... Uh, if you're in Nigeria, it's the same time zone with the UK. So that's going to be 7.30 p.m. to 8 p.m., just 30 minutes. If you're in America, in Canada, it's going to be 2.30 p.m. to 3 p.m. And you'll be mightily blessed. God willing, we're going to start something new in the month of July. And uh, we're going to make it public by the grace of God. Thanks so much, um, everyone. But I fellow you, Sister Buki, uh, my brother here. I'm looking at his face. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. I will see you again very soon. God bless you. Have a nice Sunday.